Hello everybody and welcome to Office Hours for the month of April. Uh, it is remarkable that it is only April given it's been approximately 30 years since we all saw each other last. Um, I genuinely, usually when these things come up on my calendar, I'm like, oh, but, but we just did that last week and this is the first time in a long time. Not the case. I can barely remember what we did last time. However, we're all here together again. I hope you are all well and safe. Uh, we have a very fun topic um, that I think a few of us, I know Jonathan in particular, is, is a bit of a nerd about this stuff, and I am too. So we're talking about modularity and OER, and we have a great lineup of guests. I will invite my lovely co-host Karen to introduce them to you all. Why, thank you, Zoe. I'm Karen Lauritsen. I'm with the Open Textbook Network. We are delighted to be here with all of you and the Rebus community. Today we have three guests who are going to talk about making modular OER. Each of them will spend just a couple minutes um, introducing their experience and perspective on the topic, and then we will turn things over to you and look to you to drive the conversation and ask questions. So feel free to participate in the chat. Um, and then you'll have another opportunity to turn on your microphones um, after we hear from our three guests, who are Melissa Falden. She's an instructional designer with Digital Education and Innovation at the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota, where the Open Textbook Network is based. We have Lindsay Woodside, who is Program Manager at Ontar Ontario Extend and Jonathan Lashley, who's Associate Chief Academic Officer with Idaho State Board of Education. So these are our three guests today, and we are gonna start things off with Lindsay. So I'll turn things over to you now, Lindsay. Sure, thanks so much, Karen. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm just gonna transfer over and share my screen here with you. Uh, Zoe, would you be able to share privileges with me or Yes, uh, we'll do that for you in one second. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Got it. Let me just pull it up here. Uh, okay. Everyone see my screen okay? Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as, as Karen mentioned, my name is Lindsay Woodside. I'm actually, uh, my title changed in the last two weeks. I'm actually now a digital learning associate uh, at eCampus Ontario. Uh, and those, for those of you not familiar with our organization, we are a government-funded, not-for-profit consortium and the center of excellence in online and tech-enabled learning for all 45 publicly funded colleges and universities in Ontario. And in a, in a pre-previous role, I was actually the manager of the Nursing Open at Scale program in early 2019 which was an initiative that emerged, uh, but winded down shortly thereafter due to shifting priorities. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, during that time, in just four short months, we um, were able to actually publish three short modular-based OERs in the nursing uh, slash uh, health professional field. So the, the tricky part in, in planning for today was actually to package what nuggets of wisdom I wanted to, to share with you in a five-minute overview. Uh, so my goals are, are threefold over the next few minutes, and they include the following. Number one, to provide you with a high-level overview of the nuts and bolts of the Nursing Open at Scale project. Number two, to briefly discuss the why and how behind the decision-making to a modular approach at generating OER. And then number three, finishing off by providing you with a quick peek at one of the OERs we did generate, so you can get a look and feel for how modular, at least to us, is represented in an OER. So moving right along, um, the over, uh, overarching goal for this project um, was as follows. We set out to develop a suite uh, of OERs in the nursing discipline, uh, incorporating technical innovation, human skills, and applied skills into, you know, really packages of materials that could be easily you know, picked up, ported over, repackaged, remixed, <laughs> reused, if you will, depending on the needs of a department or institution. Moving on to the why and how behind the decision making for a modular approach, which I'll explain through the project's two phases. So first we engaged a research team to conduct an environmental scan to uncover existing oer that be, could be leveraged for this project and and that team amazingly uncovered over 350 open resources related to nursing 
At the same time, we reviewed the types of co uh, courses offered in years one and two of nursing programs across the province. And we developed a list of seven common foundational nursing curricula, sort of think like umbrella themes, um, like the ones you see on the screen here, nursing as a practice and nutrition. We knew that it wasn't feasible, sort of given our people power within our team to create OERs at scale for years, you know, one right through four, right out of the gate. So we started with them um, with just years one and two. We then held a co-design session with nursing faculty and other reps from uh, our institutions to better understand what they as the experts deem to be common foundational nursing content that would fit under these larger sort of curricula umbrellas. Uh, and at the same session, we also co-designed an instructional design template and style guide uh, specifically for nursing OER generation. We focused, I think it's really important here to mention, we focused on this smaller modular sort of unit type content ideas generation with these stakeholders, primarily because we wanted to develop, you know, high quality, adaptable and accessible OERs that met an immediate need and contributed to the discipline, you know, fairly quickly. And we'd been advised by our senior advisor team, uh, comprised at the time of two nursing experts, that there likely would be great uptake with a modular approach. So from there, we then compared the environmental scan to su the suggested content ideas from those stakeholders to determine how we could best leverage uh, existing OER to match their suggestions. And then of course, what new content needed to be created to broaden the repository of nursing OER. Finally, we refined things even further to identify three high impact content areas for modular OER creation as our starting point in this project. So in phase two, our attention from the beginning of May until the end of June was to focus, uh, this was last year, was to focus on generating the content for these three high impact, but relatively small, short, you know, modularly, that's a word, friendly designed OERs. Um, and, and we did so through a series of sprints. So we onboarded three sprint teams, which included participants from nursing faculties, multimedia designers, biomedical illustrators, nursing students, public health experts to assemble in our offices in Toronto and at Ryerson University to create these OER. And I'm really still amazed at what we were able to do in such a short window of time. We created uh, three OERs in these topic areas that you see listed here. All three of these OERs have been published uh, on the eCampus Ontario Open Library, uh, and we've um, we've had we've seen great adoption with an uptake within the with, with 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 these OERs as well. So that being said, I'm just going to toggle over. Just bear with me here. Um, uh, I want to share with you. Oh, sorry. Okay, so whoops. I'm just going to toggle over and give you a sneak peek at one of what one of these OERs looks like, just so you can see what I mean by modular. And I'm nearly done here and I'll, I'll pass it off to the next person. Um, you can still see, you can see my screen here, Interpreting Canada's Food Guide. Okay, so I just wanna give you a little quick sneak peek of what modular means to us. I'll try not to go too fast here, but you can see here when I, I click down and expand this table of contents, this OER has three short chapters and within each of those chapters, since we were able to co-design an instructional design template and style guide, each of those chapters looks and feels the same. So they have learning outcomes, you know, the content, and they each end with a set of like reflection questions, evaluate your learning and key takeaways. Um, the OER also includes a nice uh, relevant glossary. I think it's really worth mentioning in closing here that Modular doesn't mean less than in terms of quality. Uh, you know, we have H5P in these OER. There are real high impact medical illustrations. We shot videos with public health experts. We followed, again, that instructional design template I talked about and a style guide. Um, and I think in closing, I think we, we would have continued using this modular approach to content generation. It was easy to manage. There was a quick turnaround time. It was of high quality. Um, you know, if the, if the trajectory of the program hadn't changed. 
So in closing, hopefully you found this useful and I look forward to, to answering any questions you might have when we move into that um, designated discussion time. Thank you very much, Lindsay. I'm now going to hand things over to Melissa. Hi there. Uh, so yes, as was said earlier, my name is Melissa Paldine and I'm an instructional designer with the Digital Education and Innovation Team in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota. Quite a mouthful. Uh, in my work as an instructional designer, I'm continually addressing course content needs as I consult with our instructors and we're often discussing open resources um, and the ability to use it or potentially often open textbooks, but uh, I'm joining you today with another experience in mind, um, a pilot authoring program that was conducted with our chief information officer at our college, David Ernst. Dave is the founder of the Center for Open Education at our university, which is home to the Open Textbook Network and the Open Textbook Library. And uh, within his extensive work with all things open, uh, a couple of years ago, Dave wanted to pilot an authoring experience with a K-12 school district here in Minnesota. Um, it was the largest school district in our state. Uh, and I worked with Dave on this project, developing the process and then later facilitating this process where small groups of teachers, K-12 teachers, created textbooks to be used in their classes throughout the district. Um, our authors were brand new to the concept of open and to authoring and our pilot was bounded by time. Uh, being we had very little of it, uh, the district was willing to compensate instructors for limited additional summer pay, but essentially we're looking at creating these books with about two days of foundation setting and training and four days of writing. It was, it was truly a sprint and that sprint resulted in a project that could, I could speak to for hours really. Uh, but in aligning with this office hour session today, I want to speak to just one element and that one element is kind of how we use modularity in the, the setup and the actual technical process of creating our book. So um, for various reasons too many address today, uh, we, but not the least of which was time, we were leaning into open existing resources and the ability to remix those resources. Defining the book structure and what we called the elements within the book became critical to our overall creation. Not only did this provide a practical, actionable framework to align content to, it allowed us to create identical Google, Google Doc structure that allowed it for collaborative writing. But the process also assured consensus from authors and allowed for future conflict resolution as when any, any issues arose, the groups were able to go back to the framework they defined for quick resolution. The process also resulted in a somewhat tangible aspect to authoring. This was, for many of our K-12 authors, kind of a pie in the sky idea of creating a textbook and becoming authors. And now that was something that became to take uh, shape and have form and have a future. We created a very low tech framework for our books. We used large post-it notes to organize the different modules within our book. Uh, and sometimes those post-it notes when we ran out became half sheets of paper. Uh, we held brainstorming sessions where the authoring groups were asked to outline their future books independent of the content matter by writing out parts of their, their ideal books on this large post-it note. So when we renew, renewed these, reviewed these notes, uh, we were removing duplicates, reconciling language, assuring that everyone was, was in consensus as to what this book was going to look like. And then we divided the post-it notes into what we called structure and elements. So I, at this point, um, it might be helpful to share um, very quickly. Our structure we defined as kind of the big big elements of a book, so whether we're going to divide this into units or chapters, whether you'd have subsections, if you've had a table of content, dependencies, things like that. And then our elements were aspects um, that would be replicated within, consistently replicated within that structure. So the learning objectives, overviews, whether you'd have practice sets, whether you'd use key takeaways, summaries, things like that, anything that was going to be very specific to, um, to that particular 
we're actually creating three different books within this pilot. Um, and then what we did was really just line out these uh, post-it notes in a way where we said, okay, on the, the left-hand side of whether we had a board or a table or what have you, we're going to have our structural elements and then horizontally aligned to that vertical structure, we're going to add elements of our books. Um, we did this again independent of the content uh, matter that was going to be in the book. So this was just structure and element and we were able to kind of reorganize by just lifting moving these post-it notes as needed to make sure that everybody was in consensus that the book looked like something we wanted to to pursue and that ended up literally looking something like this. So we would have you know book chapter section and quite a bit of discussion as to how are we going to move these things around. Um, does it make sense that we start with a title page or a title? How are we how granular are we going to get this? Um, and that led us to a pardon me, many tabs open. That led us to um, a structure that we could then map all of our um, content pieces onto and create and replicate the structure with the content pieces in uh, a, a Google folder where then uh, it was very easy for us to um, go out and find the pieces of, of content that we were going to need to use to create the book, to identify gaps where we we're going to have to create additional resources. Um, and we were able to do this with all very kind of low tech collaborative uh, tools that we that were very common to the the instructors that were actually writing these books. We found that during this creation process, our authors continually referred to this framework and to more easily identify gaps in the content to draft their content areas. Um, and ultimately, this structure allowed us for a kind of ease of reorganization for our, our future versions of this book or future enhancements or adapt adaptations. And uh, I look forward to answering any questions you might have about this. Super. Thanks, Melissa. And with that, over to you, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar names and faces on the call. And yes, happy birthday to the Open Textbook Library. Um, as, as Zoe mentioned, um, modularity, I, I consider myself a big nerd for it because really it's the modular aspects of OER that got me involved with the open education community in the first place. Um, my early career was actually in graphic design and web development. And so the idea that you would have modular content that you would share openly um, and be able to kind of take bits and pieces that are represent certain quality or certain features that you want and then play bricoler and take all these disparate items and bring them together for a new whole is I, I think a philosophy that's core to any sort of modern web development, but also graphic design, art. And I would also argue, um, because at least this is the case for me, and this has been the case for a lot of faculty I've worked with on OER, it's also core to our academic lifestyle, whether it's we're taking disparate pieces of content that are discrete uh, from different things that we've read and combining them together to create new scholarship, or, um, developing our syllabi and our course, um, our, our, our course assignments and just general curriculum. And granted, my, my early teaching uh, was in, in composition. And so this is core to how we're, we're taught to teach writing. Um, the idea that we are effective writers when we're effective readers because we have, um, we have myriad influences and then you're the common factor and taking all those influences and combining them to one complete whole. And so, uh, in, in just in my work with faculty specifically, I've seen over and over and over again, and this was the case for me, uh, I was a Creative Commons junkie and I was practicing open pedagogy and OER long before I knew about the term open education, just because no one, single piece of um, instructional content, no one textbook faithfully helped me teach the class I wanted to teach. And so I was constantly going out on the web and finding what's available for free, whether it's fair use, whether it's openly licensed, uh, what can I leverage in, in, in some cases, what can I go through and gain access to that I probably shouldn't have access to, but it's just so important to share it with my students that I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, I've, I've since, the you know dismiss those practices but 
the, the key component there, and I found this over and over and over again when talking to faculty uh, for the first time about open educational resources, is that you know, under the, the terminology, they think this is a new concept and I, I just don't have time or bandwidth to, to improve my course if you're, so I don't wanna to talk to you about OER. But if approaching those conversations differently and asking, hey, how do you teach your class? What materials do you use? What, what experiences do you want your students to um, encounter? And, and how do you wanna support them through textual materials? Uh, nine times out of 10, faculty have been using OER not knowing it. Uh, this has just continually been a theme that I've seen with faculty. And actually, I, I know there's some faculty on the call who I'm currently working with, and it shouldn't be a surprise that their projects um, naturally are taking a more modular tact because what they're finding is there's, I think specifically about an English group I'm working with right now, there's a wealth of open content that's out there, high quality open content. And th that it creates a whole new problem where it's just like, well, where do we start? Where do we stop? What do we take? How do we effectively navigate all this and create the most exhaustive resource possible? And then, and I think that's the first impulse. And then you start diving in and realizing, well, I don't need to use all of this. And because it's openly licensed, I don't have to. And so now you, they, they're finding a sense of agency where it's like, well, I can curate the resources that are going to be most impactful for me and make a, an educated suggestion, but also, just because I produce a resource that's new, some, some new bricolage, doesn't mean that someone's going to adopt that whole hawk either. That they can go in and, it, and this practice inspires new practice in recycling and reusing and finding disparate pieces. And so it's that sort of sustainable, scalable infrastructure around OER that is complementary of, of my work as an artist, my work as an educator, my work as a designer, and then just generally a creative person who cares about presenting access. And so the knowing I only have five minutes, the only other thing I would say um, from a technical standpoint with modularity is that the more you can work on HTML and broadly portable and modular formats, the better. Um, it's, it's where uh, I've also been a, a real evangelist of platforms like Pressbooks because you know, by any means, is it the most exhaustive? No, but it, it takes a lot of what's already out there in web environments and allows us to remix more easily. And so I'm always on the lookout for tools like that. Thank you, Jonathan. So we've heard from Lindsay, Melissa, and Jonathan, and now we'd like to hear from you. Uh, the first question that was in the chat was from Kathy. She was looking for a copy of the guide that Lindsay mentioned, and Lindsay has put that there in the chat. So um, it's a PDF that you can download. Now uh, for other questions, feel free to unmute your microphone or, or put them in the chat. I will get us started. Um, Lindsay, you talked about a stakeholder uh, sort of co-design session in your first phase. Can you talk a little bit more about what that co-design session looked like? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, so we actually, um, we met early on, actually recently, when after, directly after I was hired, we met, um, we met with, uh, like I said, nursing, um, nursing experts, instructional designers, uh, librarians, uh, students were at that meeting, sort of a large key stakeholder group um, to um, help us design that, the content that would be part of that modular approach. So um, if we get into sort of the nitty gritty, just a few sort of granular examples of how that worked, it was sort of taking those curricula umbrellas that I talked about, like, you know, we needed to have some prep done in advance in order to guide that discussion at that stakeholder meeting. So it was taking those like curricula umbrella themes and then just, you know, doing like a um, sort of a um, musical chairs. We actually had the, the stakeholder groups at four different tables around the room. We gave them like, you know, uh, five minutes on the wall, each of those curricula themes were posted up. We gave them five minutes as they moved around in, in their groups, uh, visiting each of the uh, curricula umbrellas, generating content ideas. Uh, and um, as a result, we left with, you know, all these, all these great ideas uh, that fell under these large curricula themes. And then it was our job to refine them with the help of our senior project advisors, refine them, refine them, refine them uh, down. Um, and, and what we actually ended up, you know, thinking was a starting point ended up sort of being our ending point because of course 
uh, priorities changed in government and, and uh, the, the program winded down sh shortly thereafter. But, um, but nonetheless, um, yeah, that was sort of the, the that was sort of how we organized that and how we came about that that modular approach. If that if that's helpful, so sort of you know uh, taking all of the the valuable insight that those stakeholders had and and uh, and and using it in a way to elicit um, sort of the the best um, the best material uh, to be generated, uh, um, you know, as recommended by that group. Thanks. So when so when you went from phase one to phase two, and you also did sprints like Melissa. Um, how did that content that you had brainstormed with those stakeholders um, sort of factor into that that sprint phase and any details about the sprint I'm interested in, you know, Melissa said two days training four days writing. I'm interested in your sprint timeline as well. Sure. So that was really interesting as well. I'd never actually run a sprint before. So it was it was <laughs> that was a lot of uh, learning really quickly. But basically what we did in a nutshell is we did a, we did, we posted, posted some calls to participate and armed with our understanding that we would like to develop three OER on the food guide, the vaccines and health assessment. We had interested, you know, faculty, nursing experts, students, biomedical illustrators, videographers apply um, in terms of their, uh, you know, what OER best aligned to their skill set. And so they knew what they were applying to write, like we needed the ex subject matter experts in those areas. And so when they applied, they applied with the intent that they would like to author, uh, you know, we came up with a um, sort of a frame of, uh, you know, three or four chapters, they selected the chapters they'd be interested in writing. And then, of course, we evaluated the, the applications, selected the participants to participate in, in the sprint. Uh, certainly gave them a lot of onboarding materials um, in advance to review. So when they arrived at the sprint, um, the sprint wasn't necessarily where content was written. Uh, a lot of that w was um, asked to be done beforehand, sort of virtually uh, through the group. But the sprints were actually designed to be this, the space in which we discussed any uh, and troubleshooted any um, uh, misalignment with content in terms of what the experts agreed on. And then we also used it as a space to develop the multimedia and medical illustrations and where the those would go in terms of placement within the OER. Um, so it was used as a sort of almost like a, a check-in space and, and development to some extent, but not sort of in the, in the, in the writing, the rigor of the writing sense, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That helps. Thank you. Um, Olga has a question related to um, one of your comments that you heard a lot of institutions have adopted the resource. How did you hear? We're always looking for ways to find out, you know, how are you notified about um, adoptions and use of the OER? Sure, yeah. So our open library actually has a, a form to report adoptions. And so we only hear when, when you know, instructors and, and folks fill out, fill out that form. So unbeknownst to us, there certainly could be use outside of that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's primarily through that adoption form that we try and broadcast whenever we're promoting um, a new OER in, in the open library. Uh, and obviously that really helps us in terms of reporting on, on savings and, and, um, and, you know, again, looking at uptake of OERs uh, across the board. Thanks. Arnie asked in the chat, um, and I invite anyone here, not just our three guests, but anyone in the call to this conversation, um, is this happening on a larger scale? And I think Arnie's referring to, you know, potentially standardizing structure and elements or um, thinking about different OER remixing platforms. And Arnie, I think there is a history of that out there, but a lot of challenges, as you can probably imagine, since OER can take many different forms and instructors have so many different uh, priorities and tools that they like to work with. Sometimes, you know, trying to ask somebody to learn a new tool can be a hurdle. So, um, so I would say there's probably not, and I can tell Zoe wants to say something too. <laughs> Yeah, I, this is one of those things where one of the best aspects of OER, which is the freedom and the ease of proliferation and all of that also kind of creates a bit of a problem where it's really difficult to get standardization. And, you know, there's a fine balance to meet of how much you even want to standardize because we want to preserve that, that freedom and flexibility. I do know from like a very technical platform perspective, there have been conversations in the past between um, some of the, the, uh, the platforms and organizations around standardizing in, into an HTML, a shared HTML structure, HTML book, 
I don't think they got very far. Um, it is a, a, it's just a difficult thing. Often, you know, people who are building and maintaining platforms, and I'm thinking of Pressbooks and I know OpenStax uh, with how they, they structure their content. It's hard to allocate resources to that when there are so many competing priorities. It's the kind of thing that would be amazing if we could, you know, have that underlying structure from, as I say, I'm talking to the level of like, how are you marking up the text of a, of a, um, of a book? to be portable between platforms. It's both a major ask and also is, is a little hard to think about how would that be adopted and what that would mean for people who were joining in doing this kind of work. Um, so that's not quite an answer, but it's, it's uh, I'll, I'll try and pass it off as one. Um, I would also like to add, uh, you know, that the OTN is working with an advisory group of faculty and librarians and the Cocoa Foundation, which creates Editoria, a uh, publishing platform, an open source publishing platform, to try and support this process for authors in creating more modular content, in structuring um, a textbook or elements. And so that is something um, that we hope will work across platforms. So if somebody wanted to sort of, as Melissa described, think separately from their content about, you know, how do I want this structure to work? I want to make consistent chapters. I'm going to sort of think of this before I start filling in content. They could do that in Editoria, they could export it, they could do it in Pressbooks, hopefully they can do it um, in a lot of different spaces. So that is in process. Um, it's an IMLS funded grant. I'll just put the, the link in there. If you'd like to learn more, let me know. Yeah, I'm really excited to, to um, see that come together. Karen, I've, I've chatted with um, with Dave about it before. And it's, it's one of those things where uh, modularity at the level of the content is incredibly practical from a creator perspective. I have a cat who's about to join me, so we'll just allow that to happen as it will. Um, it's practical from an author perspective, from a creator perspective, anybody who's managing a book. Um, and, and at the same time has real benefits for downstream uses, and the immediate one is obviously students. Um, having well-structured content that's been thought through in this way is incredibly valuable. And in addition, there's kind of with, you know, with OER, okay, we've got um, with OER, there's the secondary audience or another audience that I think has equal importance, which is, uh, you know, like what Jonathan was talking about, other faculty who are looking for these resources and how they can fit them all together. So the more we can start to build these practices in as habit when we're doing the work of creation, the better for everybody, for, you know, all of us who are working in all our different ways with OER having consistency in structure, um, again, as I say, with preserving the, the flexibility uh, is, is really valuable. So as I say, I'm excited to see what comes out of that work with Coco to support that. Yeah, if I could just piggyback off of what Zoe is saying. So when I was at Clemson University, I worked in online education there. And part of our course development process was, was really about teaching faculty how to fish, so to speak. And so we were introducing not only modularity of content, but modularity of their course, right, and designing across the modules of learning management system. But we were also introducing topics like accessibility considerations. And at, at the institution, when I was there, OER was such a nascent concept that uh, we made, I think it, it turned out to be a pretty shrewd decision to just sort of include OER from the get-go as a really common mainstay in online course development because the faculty are new to online learning um, why not just throw all the newness at them at the same time, right? And so uh, I think that's an important point to really emphasize with, with your question, Arnie, and I think it's a great question, is that it's not just about the modularity and the fact that the content's available, but where I'm always looking at how can we better scale and how can we better structure this is really looking at the quality piece early on. And I, I think it was Lindsay who said that, you know, modular does not have to mean lesser quality necessarily. and, and the fact that I'm working with right now, we're finding that as well. By thinking about the little discrete pieces that you want to improve, you can ensure from the get-go that they're accessible, your focus is not as distributed, so you're able to zero in on what's going to make this an effective piece of content that other people might want to use. And so it's, it's, it's just an ongoing process, but I think the more that we can create habits around you know, accessibility just being core to what we do when we're developing content for use in instructional purposes or um, developing an HTML because we know it's going to be more portable across digital platforms. Those are things that can help.
I'd like to maybe address one more element, Arnie. Um, uh, specific to this K-12 project uh, in creating textbooks, we, we look to standardize within the book, but not across, say, all three books, and very specifically for the, the kind of end use case scenario. We had instructors that were gonna be teaching the first trimester and the second trimester and the third trimester. Some of those teaching styles were something that the, the authoring groups were very aware of. Others in the district were maybe not going to teach, teach to the book in the exact way they were, but they wanted to have the content correct, right? So it, they uh, were very, very specifically looking at we can parse this out and I'm going to make chapter two, chapter eight, right? And it was very easy to take that out like a block and push it into the other space. So I would maybe encourage the idea of what's, what's your audience actually going to be doing with the book if they're teaching from it. And that might be moving away from standardizing. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I had a question for you actually related to your process and, and the fact that you um, separated the content from the structure. I wonder in, you know, working with um, instructors, if that was sort of a, a challenge for them to sort of thread those things out, or how did you keep those conversations separate? Or was it kind of in the mix and, and but not on the post-it notes? Can you say more about that? Yeah, you know, it was, it was somewhat in the mix kind of back of mind. Um, we basically had said, you know, imagine your ideal book when you were a student, what, what helped you to learn? Was it having a summary? Was it having practice sets, right? Because we found that people, um, this will sound kind of odd, but got too fixated on the content and then kind of lost sight of how they, the content was actually gonna meet their objectives. And so, the, the kind of the structural elemental pieces um, assured, assured kind of a path of objective activity assessment. And then we were able to align that content without muddling the picture for, for the authors at the time. It, it really was an idea of it was almost too much to think of um, putting the, 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 the content into these consistent pieces from chapter to chapter. So psychologically, it was a, a method of kind of breaking that apart and making us more efficient. Thanks. Um, related to your work with K-12 folks, Amy has a question in the chat for you. In higher ed, the arguments are broadly about affordability for individual students and academic freedom for faculty. But in K-12, the savings go to the districts and decision-making is centralized. Can you say anything about sort of how you, start, how you, how you persuade those in the K-12 environment to move towards open in that particular context? It's a bit sure. of a well, part, yeah. Yeah, well, there's, maybe there's two parts to this. I would say that first off, um, Dave is a great persuader. And so he, he was the, uh, the individual that was talking kind of the district of what kind of savings we could have in our textbooks. Um, in, in the cost of their textbooks. So it was still district saving. For the instructors, it was just looking at the textbook as a different type of use case for their, their students. So now, typically in K-12 scenarios, you have a textbook where, right, we're taking those, um, the, the uh, paper uh, grocery bags and making textbook covers to protect them because you might lose it, lose it on the bus, you might mar up your book, you can't use your book as you would in higher ed. And so talking to instructors um, in, in convincing them that this is a, a book that now students can actually use, right? You can write in the margins, you can scribble over this. If you lose the book, it's at cost. So it's probably something like seven bucks. That's not a, a debt that's weighing over uh, parental units to have to pay back a hundred dollar textbook because the set is now um, diminished. Um, the students can take that on to future years and so maybe they have biology and then they take that biology book to advanced biology um, so seeing the book as a tool meant kind of disrupting the mindset of how we would typically use a book in k-12 and then that was a very easy shift for our instructors the hard shift potentially was um, honestly in this environment uh, digital versus print that uh, we had assumed that we had a lot of folks that wanted digital books for their students to use, but there was a lot of concern about access, accessibility, equity, um, 
an actual use. And so we did ultimately provide print books and uh, digital books. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Melissa. And thanks for bringing back memories of covering my hardback elementary school text with paperbacks. I had forgotten about that. <laughs> the artistic expression that enabled. All right. I have a, a question, question for Lindsay, partly related to what Melissa was saying um, previously about consistency between books. Um, you, you obviously put out three, but I know there were others that were kind of planned. Was the, the, the picture of how you would see people using them be that chapters would be taken from each of those book containers and put together? Or were they sort of s s more standalone? And, and what was the consistency like between the books that you output? And I'm curious whether you had a, a similar or, or a different approach to uh, Melissa's project. Yeah, I think that the that's a great question, Zoe. I think initially the the um, the project team sort of um, assumed that um, the the way in which we were approaching um, content generation and, and publishing of these OERs would be that they would be to augment existing resources within the curriculum. Um, so um, they could be used to you know fill a gap or as a replacement to maybe you know um, a book and a chapter that you know a faculty wanted to. Um, see a departure from in some way. Um, but then uh, as it as they developed, and, and although they're still modular in nature, um, they, be, they actually became quite robust. There was a real sense of ownership from the, um, you know, incredible um, subject matter experts that we hired. Um, and um, I, I think they, I think they can serve as, and I know they can serve as, because we know that they've been adopted as ind individual resources. Although, um, you know, one of the things on our, our um, one of the things that would be worth looking into actually as a result of your question would be to see if they're used to replace um, replace an existing textbook or augment an existing textbook, which would be which would be interesting to note. Um, but um, nonetheless, I think in, in some courses, I know the, the health assessment OER, I know that there's a first year nursing course all on health assessment, and this is quite a robust OER. So I can see in some cases how that may have been used to um, in, in its full suite uh, to replace a textbook. Um, and then your second question was, sorry, what was the second follow-up? Was that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that covers everything okay. <laughs> I was interested in. Thank okay. you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I will say I've, I had been fortunate to have conversations with the eCampus team as they were putting, you know, kind of envisioning this project. And it's a model that I would be really excited to see applied uh, uh, elsewhere and, you know, to the kind of discipline approach. And again, um, you know, something that sticks with me about modularity is that it does apply right from the very macro level, which is what you took, identifying a space, what are the components of it, what are the components of each of those, and, and cascading down to the very individual resource, to the level of, you know, a single, a single chapter, a single paragraph even, that Jonathan, you know, pointed out that the approach to writing can be very modular too. It's applicable at all levels um, in some really powerful ways. Yeah, so I'd, discipline. I'd like to... Sorry, sorry, Jonathan. That's fine. I uh, I just want to jump in and, and highlight some of what I'm seeing in the chat because I think um, Matt and Kathy bring up some really excellent points about engaging with K twelve on this specifically. Um, Matt talking from the standpoint of personalized learning, and, and Kathy mentioning this idea of professional development and that that can happen at any level of education. Um, just in my own experience in in Idaho. We have one central state board of education overseeing K through 20 across the state. And so uh, like right now, one of the faculty members I'm working with, um, he's a dual credit faculty member part time, but he's a full time high school French instructor. And his interest in this, um, because again, the, the affordability standpoint um, may, maybe doesn't have that much persuasion for his local leadership, where they are interested is how can we think about the life of the learner? And how can we think long term about what it means for people to have ownership over the materials that they use in their classes? And with OER, um, this is a case of like open pedagogy where students who have maybe supplemental resources that he's helped create, they're openly licensed or modular, that they can take the bits and pieces that are useful to them. And say in the case of uh, French language instruction, these are resources that his students now can fall back on in, in subsequent years when they're taking new French courses or they go to France and they want to brush up on 
these sort of modular and discrete pieces of instruction that they had exposure to. Thanks, Jonathan. All right, our hour is drawing to a close. So if you have any additional comments or questions or things you would like to talk about, now is the time. If not, oh, love Jonathan sharing his perspective on OER before he knew it was OER. Thanks, Kathy. My life would have been a lot easier if I knew about OER instead of just stumbling around in the dark, but I, I found the light eventually. Great conversation about OER in the K-12 environment. A surprise outcome of today's conversation. Maybe a one for us to explore in the future. I see a Perva nodding. She's, she's already making note of it. <laughs> All right, well, Zoe, I'll hand things over to you and then we can thank our guests and uh, tell you what's in store for next month. Thanks, Karen. Um, I just did want to say as we're wrapping up, um, we uh, have been running a little bit of a, a short series of short webinars trying to start thinking about how to apply the, print, the principles and practices of OER in response to the, the, the how do I even express, the moment in which we live and all its very many challenges uh, within higher education. So I'll ask a just to share a link if anybody's interested in continuing this conversation, how we can kind of be thinking about these modular pieces of, of OER to respond to moving classes online very quickly or other subjects we have a list of kind of running ideas and we're we're wanting to to you know keep our ears open and listen to you folks as well so if there's a, a particular challenge that is facing you in this moment we are very very keen to work with you and work everybody and with everybody in the community to find solutions together um so uh, that's there in the chat for you from a prover and we we hope to see you around with that um and with that i'll pass back to karen for for official wrap up thank you all right. Thanks, Zoe. And thank you to Lindsay Woodside, Melissa Falden, and Jonathan Lashley for joining us today as we talked about modular OER. It was great to hear your stories. And thanks to all of you for coming and participating in the chat or um, simply listening in. We appreciate you and uh, the work that you're doing and look forward to seeing you next month when we will talk about money and budgets and how to make a budget and even share some spreadsheet templates. So pretty glamorous stuff, uh, but <laughs> I know, but a uh, part of our reality. So um, we hope that you will join us then. Aperva um, put a link in the chat. It's there for you uh, if you'd like to RSVP or um, save the date on your calendar. Until then, best wishes and see you soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye everyone, take care. Thanks. Thank you.